Okay, very important verse because a lot of churches will actually spend all of their free time. You know, when people are off of work or whatever, they spend all of their free time having the people come in and work on the church building. And that's wrong. Your job as a Christian is the ministry of reconciliation. You, and a, you are an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And you should be doing something about evangelism, not keeping a building up and going, not scrubbing the toilets and mowing the yard and painting the walls. Okay, if that's all you're ever doing, then you are becoming unfruitful. All right, that building that you're taking so much time to take care of is eventually going to be under the control of the Antichrist. Okay, during the tribulation, it's probably going to get destroyed. So what are you putting so much time into it for? And of course, if you listen to the message, I get into that about how that people have gone, instead of the Christian church going out to evangelize the lost, no, now the lost come into the church building. Completely unscriptural. Uh, I believe, and we believe here, Bible Believers Fellowship, our house church, that when the group gets too big, then you split the group in two. And what you do at that point is, the men of the church get together and they pick out one man who is able to teach others. Okay, He's faithful. He's a good man. You go down through the list there in Timothy and you pick him out and you say, okay now, brother so-and-so, you're going to head this group. And the pastor of the current big group, you're going to stick with the first group there. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 talk about this thing of splitting off and having a young man that is found faithful. It says, Paul writing to Timothy here, he says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Okay, that is so important to get, and a lot of the big church buildings do not understand that. They build on to the church building, and they buy and they acquire bigger properties, but they're all staying in one place. And you get the pastor there, and he pastors for 40 or 50 years. It's kind of a problem. Okay, the Bible does not teach that we are all to stay in one place. You're to spread out. And think about what happens when you spread out. Well, the Word of God is, it moves out then. It goes out. It's not all sticking in one little place there. I mean, imagine a map of, of America, and you have this little red dot here, and that little red dot there, and, and all these red dots where it's the centers of Christianity, and we have a good Bible-believing Baptist church there, and you have to move to one of those red dots. And uh, that's something else. I want to just warn about something that's very popular, especially among the Baptists, and I consider myself a Baptist doctrinally, if you really want to get into it. But there's a teaching there where they talk about being part of a local church. Local church. Look it up in the Bible. There is no term local church. Okay? It's not in there. And what they try to get through, and some of them actually teach, that if there's no good local church in your area, then you should move your family to a place where there is a good church. Now that is completely unscriptural. Completely unscriptural. Because what you have is, all the Christians are over here in this county, but there aren't any here because there weren't any good churches. Well, guess what? The tracting, the ministry of reconciliation is now over in that area where you just moved from. See? And it's all now concentrated in that one church and in the surrounding neighborhood there. That's not of the Lord. Not of the Lord. Okay, if God has you in an area and there aren't any good churches, start a house church and from that house church, get the gospel out in your local community. You become the local church. All right? You don't move someplace else and, and get away from that area. No. Do the ministry there that God has appointed you to. If I mean, what better reason to stay in an, er in an area than if there are no good churches in that area? Being in this area, what, I'm not going to move to some place where there is a good church. 
The Lord needs the work to be done here and nobody else is doing it. And if you are in that situation, if you are in an area where there aren't any good churches, for heaven's sake, don't move. Don't go to find a good church and move to it another hour, hour or two hours away. Stay in your area and get the ministry done. You become the local church. All right? You become the one that is faithful and that teaches others. All right? Now, next, in the next section, I want to talk about legal issues. So let's take a look at that. Okay, now we want to talk about some legal issues. Should you register with the government? Should you be an unregistered church? What about this thing of 501c3? What does that mean? Well, back, let me explain to you what 501c3 is. Um, this was a code that was created in 1954, and essentially what it does, what 501c3 is, if you have, if you apply for IRS section 501c3, it makes you a tax-exempt organization. So now, when I come to your church on a Sunday morning, and I get out my money and I put that in the offering plate now I can write off my giving at the end of the year and I can get money back isn't that a slick system now what that is is that's called sin all right you can disagree with that all you want to but it is a sin when you say I'm gonna give something to God but uh, I'm gonna write it off my taxes and get some money back you're not giving to the Lord okay that's that's not offering when you give something it's has to cost you. It's not a benefit that you say, well, I give this money, but I'm going to take some money back. Huh? I mean, how would that be if you put, if I put that money in to the offering plate and then I got up out of my seat and I walked around to the back of the church auditorium and they got the offering plate the whole way through all the pews and then I went over and I pulled out a $5 bill. They'd say, what are you doing? Well, I put 20 in, but I wanted to get a 5 back. That would be stealing, wouldn't it? That wouldn't look very good for me as a Christian. But yet that's exactly what you're doing when you write off your giving on your taxes to get money back. All right? I don't agree with it. I believe it's a sin. But the federal government did this in a way to get control over the churches. And there are a lot of great websites that you can go to. Hushmoney.org. You can read a lot on this subject. Uh, Dr. Scott Johnson uh, has preached some good messages on it. I have a uh, big thing of information here from him. He used to be on Sermon Audio. He's not anymore. But you can still find him on the internet. But I uh, just want to look at a few things here very quickly about 501c3. Alright, we have here, in the words of Steve Nestor, IRS Senior Revenue Officer, he says, I am not the only IRS employee employee who's wondered why churches go to the government and seek permission to be exempted from a tax they didn't owe to begin with and to seek a tax deductible status that they've always had anyway. Many of us have marveled at how church leaders want to be regulated and controlled by an agency of government that most Americans have prayed would just get out of their lives. Churches are in an amazingly unique position, but they don't seem to know or appreciate the implications of what it would mean to be free of government control. Now let me just state here for the record, I'm not anti-government. I'm not an anarchist. I believe in government, okay? A country without a government is in very bad shape. I am not anti-government. But secular government must be kept separate from the church. Whenever you have the church and the government merging into one, you have a problem. Okay, study the Dark Ages, study the Middle Ages. The Roman Catholic Church controlled most governments, and it was bad news for Bible-believing Christians. Okay, you don't want a church to have the power to execute people. Let me show you some other quotes. Here's another one, myth number four. 501c3 status legitimizes the church. It says here, it's a sad commentary on the church of our day 
when any church feels compelled to go to sinners to seek legitimacy. And he's absolutely right on that. Why would you go to a lost person and ask permission to start a church? Doesn't make any sense. 